Please subscribe, like, and share if you enjoy this show. Website www.thesecretteachings.info. Please go to the website, check out our full show archive, completely free to access for everybody. You do not have to sign up or do anything. You click the link, you find the show, the guest, the topic, and you can download it or stream it for free. You'll also find a top news tab with our current events. You'll find my books on the website as well as links to Amazon.com. And you'll find a guest tab with past and current and future guests. Tonight, our guest, James McCanny, his website is linked up at thesecretteachings.info. He's got a pretty lengthy bio, and I couldn't really pick out of it what I thought was the most important. So I'll go ahead and bring the audio for James up here. And uh, welcome to the show, and I'll let you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Uh, thank you, Ryan. First of all, how's the sound? Is it good? Uh, it came in a little hot, but it is good now. Uh, yeah, well, my background, uh, I have a master's degree in physics, solid state nuclear physics from Tulane University in 1975. Before that, I, my bachelor's degree I got from St. Mary's College, which is now St. University, St. Mary's University in Winona, Minnesota. And I had a double major in physics and mathematics, but uh, uh, I had the opportunities to get a Ph.D. in physics, and I just turned them down. I, I didn't want to be buttonholed into a specialty, and so I took off after my master's degree, and I went back to Latin America where I'd been uh, previously, and uh, just uh, traveled and got to understand uh, some of the ins and outs of archaeology. I kept my research, my personal research was in the area of celestial mechanics, which is the study of the movement of the stars and planets, gravity. And I started uh, including electric and magnetic fields in my uh, calculations in my studies. And uh, in 1979, I ended up at a place called Cornell University as a faculty member. And at that time, the Voyager spacecraft, the Pioneer spacecraft, many planetary probes were bringing back information from other planets. And I was able to use the data from those spacecraft to verify my studies regarding the electromagnetic nature of the solar system. So that started a long, my lifelong study. It led into my work with weather, the electrical conditions in the solar system which drive our weather, and uh, many other studies. The, my most recent study was actually just a surprise. I was in Peru. Uh, traveling, and uh, I have an invention called the wing generator, which is a very efficient system for extracting energy from wind. And I was in Peru scoping out the market for this because that's uh, it's we're uh, commercializing the first uh, model, which is the 12 meter. We call it the Pegasus. And I was scoping out uh, Peru for the market, and I happened to upon something called the Nazca Plains. And uh, I had seen them before in pictures, never really paid much attention to them. But while I was on the site, I, in fact, uh, was on some of the mounds overlooking the plains. And I realized that these were atmospheric collection, uh, elect atmospheric electricity collection points driving out into these figures that were out in the Nazca plains. And so that's my uh, current release that came out December 31st, uh, this past December 31st. It is entitled uh, Nazca Palpa Lines, the Mystery Solved Ancient Interferometer Fractal Antenna Complex. So what I discovered is that these lines that nobody could figure out what they were, why the, uh, we don't really know who made them, probably 5, 10, 15,000 years ago or possibly before, uh, why they made these. And what I discovered is these were antennas, an extremely complex antenna system. And their sole purpose was to signal uh, other star systems using atmospheric electricity as the power source because uh, this antenna grid array covers about 350 square kilometers of uh, terrain on the Palpa Plains, on the Pampas of central, west central Peru. Uh, so this is a signaling uh, mechanism for clearly for uh, signaling to and possibly receiving signals from other star systems. So this is a major, major archaeological discovery. But anyway, there's uh, uh, there's many, many other aspects to my background, uh, things that I study. But anyway, I'll stop there. And uh, on my webpage, which you said there's a link to my webpage, uh, uh, the people can check that out. My webpage has about six gigabytes of information on it. So uh, get a big cup of coffee when you go there and plan to spend a little bit of time. 
Well, I spent some time today looking through your NASCA lines, uh, the, 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 the work that you did, the document that you sent me, and I honestly didn't have time to go through the entire document, but I was looking at some of the images and I was skimming through some of the information, and, and I do have other lines, uh, other questions about some of the lines in your bio as well, uh, but let me go ahead and ask you this. This is the first thing that came to my mind. In terms of this being what you call an interferometer fractal antenna complex, what exactly was the motivation in your opinion, and maybe you know this, maybe it's in the document, I didn't catch it, for constructing these lines into the shapes of spiders or into the shapes of birds or monkeys. What, what, why, what does that have to do with the antenna aspect of this? Well, what I've uh, come to conclude is that these were designed and left for us to find. And if these were only in the, say, shape of rectangles or V-shaped or other uh, just uh, somewhat common, say, say uh, spirals, which are common fractal antenna shapes, uh, we might mistake them for possibly just agricultural troughs. They, what, what they are is they're sh small troughs, maybe a foot across or some are as much as a meter or a couple meters across, uh, and then dug out uh, just to a few inches or up to 10 inches deep. Uh, so at any rate, the, uh, the purpose for putting the shapes there is to draw our attention to them. Now, these, uh, these can only be seen from, from the air, correct? Yes, uh, although some scholars, there's, there's some controversy over that, but literally they can only be seen, and they were discovered from the air. A guy named Paul Kosek saw these from an airplane. The first time they were identified for what they are was 1941. A pilot named Paul Kosek flew over the Nazca planes on purpose to see what they looked like from the air, and he saw one of the bird shapes. Now, there are hundreds of these scattered all over the Nazca planes, distributed in a, in a very interesting pattern once you get up and you see them all. But my conclusion, to answer your question, is that these were left there for us to discover. Uh, the, uh, the monkey, which is the, the first one I have the, that's the cover photo, so to speak, on this white paper, which is 72 pages long, it's rather dense, so uh, yeah, it, it's going to take people a, a bit of time to go through it all and digest it. But uh, the monkey is a great example of a, a zoomorphic figure, which is the monkey, his tail, which is a spiral, is a fractal antenna, very common fractal antenna design. To his front and side are uh, broken dipole fractal antennas, which is a very common fractal antenna design. And then off of his feet, um, uh, an extension comes another rectangular grid fractal array, which is a very common uh, fractal array. And let me, for those people who are wondering what a fractal antenna is, your cell phone, your tablet, uh, uh, modern devices have a fractal antenna. If you remember about 10 years ago, your cell phone had a little antenna, you'd pull it out, a little uh, dipole antenna. Uh, and those were replaced by what is known as a fractal antenna. So basically, you take a long dipole antenna, you break it up physically into small shapes, and it has the same collection and transmission characteristics as a long dipole antenna, but it's very compact. So it sits down in the corner of your cell phone. And I have a whole uh, discussion, chapters and appendices on fractal antenna design. This is something I'm very familiar with because I spent 25 years in the telecommunications industry. But uh, if they only left uh, just squares or rectangles or other, or simply lines, which are the dipole antennas, or cross dipoles where they are cross lines, uh, we might mistake them for something else, maybe just astronomical pointers or something. But the fact that they're in shape of monkeys and spiders and whales and birds and things like that really bring our attention to them. In fact, most tourist pictures that you see leave out the, uh, the geometric shape fractal antenna part of this. Uh, most times you see the monkey, for example, without any of the other fractal antennas which are connected to it. I've seen that, Mind yes. you, these are all connected together, too. So when I'm looking at these lines and, and, and just using the example you gave about cellular phones and how tablets and our phones now have these fractal antennas in them, that's more of a modern technology per se. So going back to the Nazca lines, is this... I mean, obviously, that type of technology is much more advanced, especially for the time period these were supposedly erected. What is your conclusion or what is your speculation on how these came about? Is this an ancient human civilization? Uh, what is the issue there? I don't know if you've been asked that before. 
Well, in the paper, I give five scenarios. Uh, the first two, uh, uh, because I'm trying to figure out who did this too, because we don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things we know. For example, Machu Picchu, we know that the Incas built those. Uh, there's other things we know that pre-Incas built those. Uh, but the Nazca lines, we don't have any idea who built them. Uh, some archaeologists speculate that they were built by uh, the, uh, there's a uh, set of temples, etc., and structures near Nazca. And some archaeologists say, oh, it must have been these people. But when you see that the, this, uh, that those people living there were, you know, cooking in clay pots over wood, wood fires with using wooden spoons, you realize that they really didn't have anything, uh, uh, they didn't have any technology that would imply that they knew how to put these designs out there. There's nothing else in their civilization that would indicate that they did this. So my conclusion is that is totally incorrect. And But anyway, the first two scenarios that I give, uh, these were done by ancient, before the pre-Incas that we know about, ancient civilizations, or they were done by aliens, by uh, civilizations that came and visited and left these for us to find so that when we gained flight and we gained knowledge of electromagnetic transmission, uh, fractal antennas, which, by the way, uh, in modern antenna design and theory, we've only understood fractal antennas in the past 10 years. So you think we're real advanced. Well, here you have somebody, some entity, you know, 10, 15, 20, maybe 50,000 years ago. We don't know. We don't know when these were put there. Uh, but some entity putting designs, not only, I, there are six antenna designs in the complex. Uh, there's N Nazca and then Palpa is a little bit north. It's a completely separate, but it's very similar antenna complex. Uh, <clears throat> there are six antenna designs. There's the dipole. There's the cross dipole. You have a zoomorphic fractal, which is the animal shapes. Then you have geometric fractals. Then you have a hybrid, zoomorphic and geometric hybrids. Then they're connected together into interferometers. And then there's another type of antenna included, which is the long base interferometer. So you have six antenna designs, which are very complicated. I mean, the, the interferometer concept where you hook various antennas together in a complex to make a bigger antenna is a very complex modern electromagnetic theory concept. So whoever did this, <laughs> let me tell you, knew a lot about antenna design and transmission. Also, they were using elect atmospheric electricity to drive the energy to drive these. Uh, if, if someone today said, let's plug uh, the uh, local power grid in and power this, you couldn't do it you would need literally a nuclear reactor there to power these. But they were using atmospheric electricity, and that's another area of my background. And so that's one of the things that led me to this conclusion when I was on site at NASCA in the mountains overlooking the plains, realizing that what I was standing on, where these lines came up and met some of the mounds, where 55 of these antennas combined in one point, uh, in one mount, where they were driving them with atmospheric electricity. Uh, with the possibility of turning some off and on, almost like playing a piano. When, when I'm looking at these lines, I am seeing something that obviously is much more complex, especially for the time period. Not that ancient people couldn't have designed this, but in the capacity and the technological capabilities that you were describing seems very, very far-fetched when we think about history in, in, in modern uh, modern times with our modern concepts of what is or isn't possible, what did or didn't take place. I don't know if you've seen these before, but the uh, there's a there's a set of glyphs or geoglyphs in Kazakhstan, and I don't know if this supports or it parallels your theory of Nazca, but when I look at the Nazca lines, they are obviously very complex just in and of themselves, the shapes, the designs. But then there's a set of glyphs. I think there's 50 or more of them. They're relatively smaller, but they are actually, some of them are in a boxed shape or in an X shape or in a, a cross shape. They're in Kazakhstan, and they just seem less complex. They seem less uh, less relevant compared to Nazca, and uh, they, they don't seem as as complete. They don't seem as 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 as, as I, I guess, unique as the Nazca lines are. They don't necessarily, they're not necessarily designed in a specific way to convey a specific image. They're just sort of geometric shapes. So I don't know, have you, have you seen those, and do you have any thoughts on that in terms of 
the Nazca complex compared to other complexes around the world in terms of the complexity of Nazca? Uh, I, in the paper, I give two examples. One is in uh, Ethiopia, and another one, uh, the one in Ethiopia is associated, interestingly enough, with dams and water, which, by the way, Nazca is also. There's water associated with these. Uh, but in Ethiopia, there's a series of lines and uh, spirals. And in South Africa, there's a place known as the Black Spirals. And they are these the same exact same, same type of structure where they remove the rock, line them along this uh, these paths, and then dug them out. And uh, in Africa, I also have pictures in the paper. If you go down far enough, there's some uh, pictures in the paper of the Black Spirals in, in South Africa. And also there's a reference to... Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think I have pictures in the paper. I have a reference to where you can, uh, there's an extensive video that shows them. Uh, so those those two lines, but I'm, I wasn't aware of the one in Kazakhstan. Uh, since writing the paper, a man who is a pilot that flew in Vietnam sent me pictures of a similar set of arrays, not as complex, but their lines, et cetera, that are very ancient uh, in Vietnam. And uh, there's another set in Australia. And the interesting thing is you can see that there's erosion, uh, water erosion that has destroyed part of the ones in Australia out in the very dry area there, uh, showing that they're very old. In other words, the erosion would have taken place over a very long period of time. So it appears that there's a worldwide phenomenon here, and I suspect that as time goes on, uh, we're going to find more and more people are going to go, hey, you know, look at this over here. This is one, too. Yeah, uh, is... But there's there's nothing that I've seen that even rivals NASCA. NASCA is a complex, like I say, it covers 350 square kilometers. And uh, is ex when, when you look in terms of antenna design, um, if I took 100 of the top antenna design experts in the world today and we sat down in a room, it would probably take us years with computer modeling and EMF modeling uh, to even get a grasp on what these antennas were capable of doing. Uh, you have to understand when you have an antenna, it has what you call a lobe pattern. And uh, that lobe pattern is the pattern of signaling. And they get very complex once you start combining antennas. The bigger and more uh, more complex the antenna, many times the, the narrower the beam. In other words, the beam becomes very narrow. And so all of your energy is directed in one very narrow beam, almost like a laser. And so that's what we're seeing here at NASCA. So these were being directed, various combinations were being directed at different star systems. Uh, and this is extremely complicated antenna design. And like I say, the fractal antennas, we've only come to understand in the last 10 years and use them in like your cell phone, et cetera. But th this is an array that dwarfs anything that man has built for modern radio astronomy. That's another area of my expertise is radio astronomy. In the paper, I compare it to the very large array, which is in Socorro, New Mexico, 27 very large radio antennas that are coupled together in an interferometer. And then also the Arecibo large scale radio antenna, which is used for uh, astronomy in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. So I compare it to these two in the paper and the Nazca complex dwarfs anything we have built as modern man. It's pretty incredible. I'm actually looking at the uh, black spirals. It is in your paper, the black spirals of South Oh, I did Africa. include a picture of those. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's in, uh, I think it's around page 44. I've never seen those before. Those are, those are just incredible, uh, just the way that they were designed, and, and they look relatively perfect in terms of how the circles are drawn out, almost in a labyrinth. A spiral, a symbol, represents the galaxy, the universe. That's pretty incredible in and of itself. Uh, as you were saying, though, NASCA is, is much more complex uh, technologically and uh, in terms of being able to design these and uh, the fact that they really are only visible from the air. Uh, I mean, it just really opens up a wide array of questions that I have and that I think a lot of people have had for a long time. Some people might even be scared to ask those questions because they're afraid of what the answers might be. Uh, luckily, there are people like you, James, who can just sort of come at this from a very unbiased point of view, it seems, and you can provide a, a series of, of options as the possible reasons for why this was constructed, uh, a, a, a series of different um, theories for why or how the universe works that are contrary to mainline science. And I know that reading your bio, 
you probably got a lot of negative feedback uh, from other people in your field. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. And, of course, NASCA when we come back. And I would like to get into the so-called electric universe. We're talking to James McCanny, his website, jmccannyscience.com. It's linked up at thesecretteachings.info. That's www.thesecretteachings.info. Dot info, Nazca lines, and much more. I'm Ryan Gable, our guest, James McCanny. Again, jmccannyscience.com. We'll be considering the fact, as James was saying, we are just now beginning to utilize this same type of technology today. Personally, I believe it's not something that's been invented, but reinvented. I'm not sure what, what you think about that, James, but do you think that a lot of our technology today is something that's been reinvented or something that we're just now discovering? And also, if you can include in that, the types of reactions that you get out of your colleagues when you bring a theory like this to the table, how many people just outright out of complete ignorance deny it and reject it because they've been trained to perceive a new type of uh, or a different type of reality, if you will? Well, <clears throat> this particular one, uh, I wasn't quite sure what the reaction would be, but it's been amazingly positive. And, the, uh, and I have people who are engineers who are friends and and colleagues, and, and they don't have any reason to say things, uh, good things about me, just, you know, they, uh, we talk back and forth, but the reaction I've gotten from literally everybody is that this is a, a super, uh, uh, it's, a, it's right on, that it's a very accurate uh, description of what's going on there. Uh, what, what's happened is uh, this has been something that's been ignored because, uh, well, here's, let's look at a little history of the Nazca lines. In uh, the 1950s, Scientific America sent some scientists out there to do the so-called scientific discovery. And they spent about a week there, and they went out into the Nazca area, and they, they tried to duplicate making some of these lines. So they picked rocks up, and they moved them out, and they dug a little trench. And they said, ah, you know, this is a couple afternoon uh, work for, you know, a tribe of indigenous people who just like to draw pretty pictures in the sand. So that has been the scientific conclusions since the 1950s. Uh, you know, maybe basically poo-pooing it, not realizing that, in, you know, and of course back then, antenna design was hardly even well known. It was very primitive back in the 1950s. Uh, so they didn't even know what they were looking at. But the, the academic attitude towards the Nazca lines is, oh, the, you know, they might have some fanciful uh, relationship to religion or mythology or, or other. Uh, they thought that they were prayer lines where people walked around uh, the thing about the lines is that they are continuous. If you look at them, you take your finger on one of the lines and you follow it around. They never cross. They, they are a continuous line. They follow a pattern and then they come back out. And when you come back out of, of those lines, uh, there's no real uh, map of these, good map. But when I was there, I was able to look at these myself because I was there. They connect. All of these connect into hubs. And so basically what you have are fractal antennas that connect together. But when people see this and when I describe it, especially engineers who are very versed in electromagnetic theory, et cetera, they go, wow, this is it. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, and uh, the problem with archaeology is archaeologists do archaeology. Uh, antenna design people do antenna design. <laughs> in the world of modern academia, those fields don't cross. With my interdisciplinary uh, world that I followed, I, I don't have boundaries. I don't put boundaries on myself. In fact, I mentioned in the paper that the best decision of my life was not continuing to get a PhD because I have been out scouring the earth and the universe for uh, true information and putting it together. And so my life has been a, a series of discoveries and then taking those discoveries and putting them together. But basically, I've gotten an extremely positive reaction. Uh, and uh, and uh, and I think when people see it, they go, "Wow, that's what this is," and and it's it's kind of like you hit the nail on the head. It's one of those. Uh, if you went to see an indigenous tribe and they were using bows and arrows, you'd go, "Hey, they're they're using bows and arrows." In this case, they're using fractal antennas. Uh, it's just if you know what a fractal antenna is, that's what they are. They're right there. It just took somebody to point out and say, you know, that's what these are. I think a lot of people know your name, James, because of your your theory and the concept behind the electric universe. What exactly is that? I've read about it before. You are essentially the founder of that theory, per se? Uh, correct. When I was at Cornell University uh, in the 1979 to 81 era, I was writing papers and uh, publishing in astrophysics journals. 
And in the in the summary of one of the papers, I, I said this leads us to believe that we live in an, an electric universe. And so that's where the term came from. And uh, it's been copied by a lot of people because it's like one of those things that's catchy. It, it, you, it sticks in your mind. You know, it's a single term that kind of encompasses everything. But basically, uh, standard astrophysics theory, astronomy, modern astronomy or space science, believes that the universe is run by gravity. And what I discovered is that electricity plays a role. It's very subtle. It's just not all over. And unfortunately, there have been some people who really don't understand electromagnetism and uh, how these things work that make all kinds of wild claims, like the planets fly around and, the, you know, uh, all kinds of just crazy wild claims. And so unfortunately, it's been very much distorted by people that don't understand physics, basically. But, yeah, I started this concept, and here's what it comes down to. Uh, electric things in outer space, let's say a charge, a space charge, or an object that's charged, would not last very long because there's a lot of free charge in space, and what happens is they become shielded. In other words, if you had a positive charge sitting somewhere out there in the middle of nowhere in outer space, negative charge would quickly rush to it, neutralize it very fast. So you need a source of electrical energy, which is separating charge constantly. And what I discovered was it was the fusion process. So one of my discoveries was that the fusion in the sun or any fusion object like a galactic nucleus, the fusion process, part of the end result is the separation of charge. And it's a complex series of processes, but the end result is you have an excess current of protons coming out from that. And we see that as what we call the solar wind. And so anyway, what you end up with is a giant capacitor. So the planets, the moons, the asteroids, the a piece of dust that's out in the solar system will be discharging this solar capacitor. Our weather is driven by this solar capacitor. So literally, we live in an electric universe and the galaxies, etc., are uh, doing the same thing. So when the galaxies push this positive charge out, there's a return current that comes down the arms of the galaxy and I, I did a, a paper, actually in 1982, that was the start of this concept. I call it electric rivers to the stars. I have two electromagnetic propulsion systems that are used for space travel. Uh, one is a passive device. One is an active device with a nuclear power plant on board, which creates magnetic fields and pushes against magnetic fields. The other one is passive. But uh, what I've discovered is the way that people travel between the star systems. They uh, in, 19, in, what was it, 2003, I gave a talk at a conference called the UFO Congress. It was in Laughlin, Nevada, about 1,200 people attending. And there was a contingency of about 50 high-level scientists there who came to listen to me talk. Uh, in the name of that talk, which you can see on one of my videos, is uh, Electric Highways to the Stars. And so I talk about this whole scenario of traveling between the planets and stars using electric fields. But basically... The electric universe refers to the fact that we live in uh, uh, very electrified uh, conditions in the solar system, in the galaxy. And our weather, for example, one of my books is, uh, my longest book is called The um, uh, Principia Meteorologia, The Physics of Sun-Earth Weather, which is kind of a mouthful. I call it the weather book. But it's basically a, a book that describes how the planets work, including Earth and our weather systems, that are driven by these electrical conditions from the sun. And it, our weather really doesn't depend on uh, solar light. Uh, if we only depended on solar light for our weather, we'd have extremely bland weather. We'd have no hurricanes or tornadoes or, or thunderstorms. Uh, we wouldn't have clouds. <laughs> I mean, the, our weather would be extremely bland. Literally, all of our weather is driven by the electrical conditions and the fact that Earth is discharging this solar capacitor. And when we have severe storms, it's because Earth is involved in uh, external electric conditions in the solar system. And that's led me to pre predict weather sometimes six months in advance because I can see electrical conditions lining up. And I go, hey, this is a day when all you know what's going to break loose. And it's, and it's correct. I can predict because I know what to look for. It's not magic. It's, it's because I know what the conditions to look for. But essentially, uh, the electric universe is kind of a catch-all term that tells us how, uh, that, that just describes that we live not in a gravitational-only universe. We live in a universe that has electrical effects, too. And like I say, you have to be really careful because they don't manifest themselves all the time. 
And that's why the weatherman can be correct one day and completely wrong the next day, mm -hmm. because many times those electrical conditions hardly manifest themselves at all. So you have to be really careful. It's not like, uh, uh, because electric fields of themselves are very strong compared to gravitational fields, but because of shielding, we don't see them all the time. So you have to know when they're going to have an effect and when they're not. Now, let me ask you this very quickly. I was reading, uh, I, I read a lot of books. I try to finish, uh, at least recently, try to finish one book a week. Uh, this book took me a little bit longer to read, uh, that new David Icke book, The Perception Deception, is like 900 pages. And mm -hmm. in, in that book, he, he popularized, uh, I think, to a large extent, uh, the concept of the electric universe. And to be honest, that was the first place I had heard about it. But he doesn't necessarily, I don't think he mentions your name. He talks about David Talbot and Wallace Thornhill and their book, The Electric Universe and Thunderbolts of the Gods. Do you have any comments or thoughts on, on those two individuals? Well, yeah. Uh, those are people that have copied my work. They're what I call Johnny-come-latelys. Uh, Thornhill presents himself as a plasma physicist. He has no degree in physics of any kind. Uh, and Talbot is a guy who goes uh, back in the Velikovsky movement back to the 1970s when uh, Velikovsky, Emmanuel Velikovsky, had a group of uh, so-called supporters. But uh, basically, Talbot is a, a guy who has used Velikovsky's name to promote himself. Uh, and uh, now they don't even mention Velikovsky. It's like they're the, uh, but the, the term electric universe is something I uh, spawned, I, I you know, uh, brought along through years of thick and thin. And literally in around the year 2005 is when they started their Thunderbolts page. Uh, you can see, you can go look at when it was developed. And so when, when it became obvious that it was, uh, <laughs> you could, uh, they, you could uh, uh, capitalize off of this, so to speak, that's when they came on the scene. So, but uh, they really have a distorted view and unfortunately have done a lot of damage to Velikovsky and my work uh, because they are, they're not scientists. Neither one of them are scientists. Uh, I've also found out that they get a lot of support from NASA. Every day they get a picture from internal NASA files, uh, and, and they have a lot of under-the-table support. Do, do you think it's a purposeful uh, distortion, perhaps? Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, because let's, let's look at some issues. They don't talk about, say, Planet X. They don't ever bring up that topic. Well, why? Because uh, that's one of the core issues that I talk about. Uh, how could you... Uh, <laughs> Uh, talk about Velikovsky or the fact that Venus came through the solar system as a large comet and not talk about Planet X type of uh, situations. That's what Planet X is. Uh, they had a mentor named Tom Van Flandern who worked for the uh, Naval Observatory. And he was basically their handler for many years. And so these groups like this have a handler. There are people, uh, another, uh, they've had handlers all along. People that basically manage them uh, in a sense uh, uh, that come out of the scientific community. But uh, uh, Van Flandern was very emphatic that there was no such thing as Planet X, even though Van Flandern's own studies, uh, he was on a team in the Naval Observatory under contract from NASA to search for Planet X. And so on the one hand, you have the officialdom statement that there is no Planet X, and there's a lot of people out in the um, officialdom world, outreach people, etc who poo-poo this idea that there's such a thing as Planet X. And what I say is that there are many Planet X objects. There's not one Planet X. Uh, there are some references in ancient history to Nibiru and Wormwood and, and terms like that. But it's very confusing as to what object it is. And uh, So we've, we've so collectively applied that term to believing it's one object, when in fact it might be uh, a, a series of multiple different forms of objects. Oh, yeah. And, and they're literally, uh, actually, that's what I've been saying all along, and Last uh, just a year ago, in January, uh, NASA came out with two scientists, and they said that they have discovered two Planet X objects, and they uh, have found thousands more, which they're not talking about. Um, but anyway, uh, I thought that was really rare, but I, the reason for that is because I've been so successful in promoting that idea that the only thing they could do is try and take claim to that themselves. Right that there were multiple Planet X objects. So literally, officialdom has come out. But your question was about Talbot and Thornhill. You know, they don't, they don't talk about Planet X, and that's because their handlers keep them moving away from that topic. 
uh, their concept of a comet, even though they call it an electric comet, they, they don't have a theory. They're, they don't have, like I have a complete theory of how the solar system works, how the electric fields are formed, what the objects uh, uh, do when they come in, how the tail forms, etc. In fact, if you followed what they do, the tail would point towards the sun. I mean, they, that's the kind of thing that's just basic physics. They, they don't know what they're doing, uh, but they're not intelligent enough to, they're not scientists, they're not physicists, they don't understand that the things that they're saying are backwards. But anyway, it's a, but yeah, it's a distortion, and uh, it's a very intentional distortion, and a lot of times uh, what I call the disinformation crew pick up people like that as front people, and they support them. Uh, they have uh, meetings where they go to hotels and things like that. I mean, all this costs a lot of money. And believe me, you don't, well, you know, uh, you don't make that kind of money selling a few books uh, on a radio show. Uh, For sure. This is, this is not where you make millions of dollars and, and can fund, you know, conferences at hotels and things like that. Those, that takes money. Uh, you don't have a staff of people that are there every day working in an office, uh, interfacing with NASA, getting these pictures every day. NASA provides them with internal NASA photos cropped and edited in a format with an explanation and gives it to them every day. And supposedly they oppose NASA, you know, so clearly there's some funny business going on here. But the bottom line is that they are not scientists. They don't understand what they're doing. They've gotten the lingo down because they've, uh, you know, over the years have perfected their, their story, so to speak. But they've done a lot of damage to Velikovsky, to my work. And people read that, and it sounds good on the surface, but really it's a it's a distortion because they go down the path a little ways, and then they take a 90-degree left turn uh, away from the real issues. And of course, the more people that read that or they read other authors who bring that to the table, they read that, and then maybe they use it to promote their work, and then it sort of creates a chain reaction of disinformation, and, and, and that, I think, is the core essence of the reason that the disinformation is put out there in the first place. It creates a, a chain reaction that... that eventually expands, especially in the alternative communities, and then people get behind these movements, get behind these ideas, and a lot of times, especially in radio, you find people that hold on to these what we call alternative ideas or alternative theories just as staunchly as the same types of people who have tried to have you removed or have succeeded in having you removed from certain universities because of your 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 alternative, if you will, theories on the universe or in, in, in the case of comets, as I read in your biography, so it really creates a whole new controlled paradigm that's just as distorted and just as backwards as the mainline paradigm. Exactly. And the, the other thing it does, if you look at the dialogue that goes on on the Internet when people are arguing against the electric universe, they never mention my name. They talk about Talbot and Thornhill and the various things. And uh, pitting them up against real scientists, they look foolish. And they really do. Uh, because they don't know what they're talking about, because they don't have theories. They, don't, they, they talk the talk. They have a talky-talk type of thing, but they really aren't scientists. So a lot of the stuff they do is, is really stupid and, and backwards and not scientific. So they're very easy targets, so that then you can put this electric universe thing up, blow it out of the water, and then you don't have to think about it, but nobody ever mentions my name because, uh, for example, I debated Dr. David Morrison on Coast to Coast. Uh, with George Norrie as the host, uh, I got invited uh, because they wanted uh, basically someone to, uh, d uh, David Morrison was Carl Sagan's student. Uh, at, uh, and, and so David Morrison is one of the very top people at NASA. I debated David Morrison on the Coast to Coast show and won the debate defending the concept of electric universe and the, the idea of Velikovsky, etc. I won the debate, which surprised me. But that just shows that... Um, uh, you know, the, the level of scientists, and they, they don't want to send scientists out to talk to me because they know I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys, no problem, because I know what I'm doing. Uh, I've given talks at Los Alamos National Laboratory in, 20, in front of 50 of the world's top plasma physicists, and uh, I've given talks at military meetings. My aerospace uh, propulsion designs were at uh, electric propulsion conferences, strictly military uh, physicists, these guys are hardcore. I mean, they don't take baloney. You don't get up in front of them and talk, uh, and even you wouldn't be there five minutes if you didn't know what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway, uh, I have an extensive background, a very good scientific background, and uh, I've done a lot of very creative work. 
but unfortunately, yeah, the electric universe has been extremely distorted, and it's a very handy tool for the disinformation crew because they can point at that and, and just say, hey, look at how stupid this is. And it really is. Uh, so it's a, it, it gets that dialogue going between where they can control both sides of the dialogue. They can't control my side of the dialogue. And they, don't, they know that they can't send their best physicist out to confront me because I'll take them down in a minute. <laughs> Jay McCanny. Dot, uh, science.com. That's the website, jmccannyscience.com. It's linked up at the secret teachings.info. James, can you stay with us for another half hour, 45 minutes? Oh, absolutely. I'm having a great time here. So, me, absolutely. Me too. Fantastic. This is a great interview. If you would like to call in, I know I haven't given out the number very often tonight, but it is 1208 650 4160. That's 1208 650 4160. Talk to myself, talk to James. Again, his website, jmccannyscience.com. I've spent a lot of time this week preparing for the interview, just looking over some of the information on his website. There's a lot of great stuff. And, and just these alternative concepts, whether you want to believe them based on fact or based on theory or based on perception, it at least expands your mind and it allows you to have a, a, a at least it implants a seed that can perhaps grow and give you a new perspective on reality rather than staying in the, the typical old rut of what mainstream science or mainstream history, mainstream archaeology leads you to believe is true. It's all a matter of perception and perception that a lot of times, and in most cases, is not based off of the facts, is not based off of what reality actually is. It's an artificial construct. You are listening to The Secret Teachings. Our guest, James McCanny, will be back in just a few minutes. So jmccannyscience.com, that's the website. I'm Ryan Gable, our guest, James McCanny, 1208-650-4160. That's the number. And uh, James, before we go any further, it looks like we do have a caller, first name, and where you're calling from. Hi. Um, Ryan, this is Keith from New Jersey. Hi, Keith. And you guys have a hi. Um, great show, as always. Um, if you can just bear with me one second. Um, I have a friend who's a neuropsychologist, and I had read an article. And the article basically was uh, uh, an overall uh, all view of uh, part of the galaxy. And they pulled back beyond just our solar system or our galaxy, but multiple galaxies. And they called it a certain region, and I can't remember the name of it. However, when I showed this article to my friend, she looked at it and said, well, that looks, nothing, that looks like neurons. And when you started saying that the universe is electro, electric, I thought, well, maybe the universe is one gigantic mind, and it makes so much sense, your theory. Because I, and I wish I could remember the region with the, the multiple galaxies all interconnected and how they kind of fire off each other, just like the brain. And I just wanted to contribute that and ask your opinion on it. Well, thank you, Keith. Uh, James, what do you think about that? I, I actually saw that in the New York Times, I believe. There was a comparison of neurons of the brain compared to images of, of multiple galaxies. James, what are your thoughts? Well, uh let me just, uh, I mean, that brings up all kinds of connotations. But in the mid-1990s, I worked with Russian scientists in the, at the University of Novosibirsk in central Russia. Uh, they were atmospheric scientists, and they were very interested in my work because it explained the atmospheric conditions they were uh, viewing. They, were, uh, they didn't understand what was causing the uh, phenomena in the atmosphere. But in the meetings, as they were translating my papers into Russian and we were going back and forth talking about the the electric universe concepts and the the concepts of what's driving the conditions in the atmosphere. This a wind of uh, this went into the psychology department at the university, and so the psychologists started sitting in on these meetings. And the reason they were interested is because they were doing studies with unborn fetuses. In other words, they were putting sensors on the mothers and measuring the reactions of the unborn fetuses because what they were trying to do was get a basis, a, a, a physiological basis for astrology. Uh, they believed that astrology had, in fact, a uh, basis in scientific reality. But the problem in measuring people who were already born uh, was that they had all of the influences of the, the senses kick in as soon as you're born, etc. And so what they were doing was measuring the reactions based on planetary alignments. And what they understood is, because of my work, that when the planets aligned and had different other configurations, the electric uh, uh, discharges in the solar system, etc., started to occur in that the babies were picking this up. 
And when they were born, that's why being born is very instrumental in the whole concept of astrology, because that's when all your senses kick in. Some people maintain that connection uh, more uh, in the front of their mind, so to speak, with this connection with the electrical conditions in the planets and etc. Uh, and some people lose it because their other senses take over. But they, in fact, established the physiological connection between the planetary alignments and these, the psyche. And now if you look at, um, uh, this happens to me all the time. You go into a room and nobody's communicating. Everybody's at odds with each other. People that normally work together are okay. And you go, geez, what's, what's going on here? And I used to have a friend. He passed away, unfortunately. But he had a friend who was a um, studied astrology. And he'd call up his friend and he'd come back and he'd say, Jim, he said, uh, Mercury's in ret retrograde on the 12th or something. Give me a date. He said, hey, everything will clear up. You know, I'd go into that same room on the 12th. Everybody was having a good time, slapping each other on the back. Everybody was happy. And I'm going, wow, you know, this is real. There is a real connection, and it's electrical. Uh, and so the, the concept that, in fact, we, you know, the Schumann residents uh, with Earth, we are connected electrically with this planet. Uh, in fact, if a lot of people cure ailments by walking in the dew in the morning, because what that does with your bare feet, I mean, you go out and walk in the grass with the dew on the grass, and it connects you electrically to the earth, and it cures, it, it gets your body back in tune. And so, uh, yeah, we are very connected. Our body is an antenna. If you look at the Nazca complex, for example, part of this antenna complex working is based on water. And so uh, the, our bodies are like, what, 98% water or something. But we are very much an antenna, our neurons, etc., and we're very connected to the earth. We're very connected to the vertical electric field, which we live in. And we're very connected to the solar system and the planets. So uh, I hope that um, that's just kind of a wandering uh, discussion here on that topic. Now, Keith, I'll, Keith well, I'll have to let, let you go in a second. But if you want to go ahead and comment, and then if you have another question, uh, go well, ahead. I, I, I do. I just, um, when you, uh, just a two things. One is when you say antenna, it's also, it, it, I'm assuming it's dial, it, it's both, uh, ascending and receiving. Um, Absolutely. But, okay. The other thing is, would you, what, what, the auric field itself, is that something electrical in your mind? And the, uh, thank the, you, and I'll, I'll hang up. And, uh, the, the which thank, field, thank, Keith? Keith, I'm which sorry? field? You said uh, the, the field, field, and I the auric field around the energy, the energetic field around the body. There's a, there's an auric field that. Um, oh, oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't hear it on the on the air here, so now okay. thank you. I'll um, hang up and uh, thanks so much, both of you guys, for your time though, and uh, you guys are absolutely fascinating. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. Bye bye. All right, bye. All right, go uh, ahead, James. Uh, yeah, I when I was fifty, when my fiftieth birthday present, not to date myself. <laughs> But that was a while ago. Um, I gave myself a present, and I wanted to learn about health. So and I, I didn't want to go into the medical field, so I went to massage therapy school for two years, a night school. And so uh, I, and I got a, a degree in massage therapy, and I, I've never really practiced um, as a professional. I, I did a little bit as part of the schooling, et cetera, but, but uh, I wanted to learn about health. But in this, um, we had classes in auras. And we went in a room, a dark room, and we read each other's auras. And I'm like, holy cow. You know, and here I am studying the electric universe and all of this other stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, th this was um, uh, prior to working with the Russian scientists. But, um, uh, you know, understanding that the, the body, and it's like an antenna pattern. If you understand, like I was talking about lobes of an antenna, these, the lobes are the signal pattern. So if you're in the middle of a lobe, you have a much stronger signal than a person that's off on the side lobes, for example. Uh, and there's some zero points where if you're there, you don't get any signal from the antenna, even though you might be close to the antenna. So, But your body is very similar. And coming out your right out of the middle of your stomach is uh, your the main focus of your aura. And other people have different auras. Uh, apparently, my hands are, uh, a guy told me one time, he said, I have very healing hands. And uh, he took his hand and he put it up to mine and I could feel this force. I, I mean, he was pushing hard and he could, he could not get his hand up to my hand the way he was cupping his hand. And he said, you have a very strong amount of force in your hands. And he called them healing hands. And I'm like, you know, so, so there's all of this stuff. I think uh, too many times modern medicine poo-poos this kind of thing. 
but uh, you know, there's very definitely a lot of things that I think we're just starting to uh, understand or we're starting to uh, cross that boundary because standard science, you know, if you can't put a voltmeter on it, then it doesn't exist in terms of modern science. But that was one of the beautiful things about the Russians, uh, psychologists, is they were literally measuring the reaction of the unborn fetuses, and then when they were born, the various reactions after they were born, etc. And they said, yeah, there's no doubt that, that we are connected to this electrical universe. Now, in terms of Keith's call, and uh, I want to thank Keith because that was a very, very concise and very type of uh, professional call, if you will, compared to how some people call in. So if you would like to call in, use Keith as an example, one two zero eight six five zero four one six zero. And Keith, if you would like, you don't have a copy of one of my books, send me an email at rdgable at yahoo.com, and I'll hook you up with the one that you would like. Um, James, I would like to add to what Keith was saying in terms of antennas and the brain and, and the universe. What about the concept of DNA in a crystalline form also being a receiver transmitter of data, and how does that tie in with the electric universe and the electricity of the human body? Well, uh, let's take a great example here. Recently, NASA sent a probe to the tail of a comet, Comet Temple 1. And when they came back, they took the, 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 the material that was gathering up the dust from the comet tail, and they found nucleotides, which are the basic building blocks of DNA and RNA. But a nucleotide is a, is a very standard molecule. It's built up of nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, and um, uh, uh, carbon. So those four atoms, and they, they come together in various combinations, but they're very distinct combinations, and those are the building blocks of life, the nucleotides. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, the universe, uh, my book called The Diamond Principle, I go into this discussion, if we found a diamond over here on Earth, and, and you say you were the first guy to find a diamond in the ground, would you think this is the only diamond in the universe? Or would you look for more? And then you'd look for more, of course, and you'd find more. And then you, if you became aware of other star systems in the universe, you would have to come to the conclusion that over there on the other side of the universe, the diamond is the same. Uh, diamonds are unique in that they have fractures and each diamond is different. But the basic properties of the structure of the diamond is the same. And so anyway, the, the concept carries over to DNA. So the DNA in your left hand is the same as in your right hand, and it's the same as the plant out in the front lawn. And it's the same as the DNA across the universe. So the fact that we come out as a biped with two eyes and symmetry, symmetrical uh, bisymmetry, for example, uh, it has to be duplicated in the rest of the universe. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're living in a universe where we can expect to see abundance of life. And uh, are they going to have oak trees on the other side of the universe? No, but they're going to have trees. They're going to have uh, entities that are plants that are very efficient at gathering energy uh, from from a solar, like a fusion-based uh, star. So, uh, you know, and of course, the amazing diversity in, that comes out of DNA, we see that. But, uh, yeah, this is, uh, it's all connected and it's all electrical. If you look at chemistry, uh, it's the uh, covalent bonding and the uh, electrical exchange between the atoms that causes the bonding. And uh, that's the basis for the chemistry of the universe. It's the as above, so below, the macro, micro, cosm. And uh, just as a side comment to some of our listeners out there, I find it very interesting, not just the subject matter that you're discuss discussing and the science that backs it up, but the fact that as a culture collectively, we have been conditioned through social engineering and other forms of social control to believe and it's not that movies are bad, but to believe that Star Wars and the concept of the Force and, 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 and this interconnectedness of everything is somehow more important than actual reality, where this, to, to, for all intents and purposes, is actually a form of the Force, if you will. It's, it's a form of that interconnectedness. It's a form of what we see in the movies, but we're more concerned about the, about the, 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 the fictional aspects of it. And I think that reality, James, is just as incredible, if not more so, than what we see in the movies. And to take that to another level, looking at technology, I know that you've been removed from universities before for your theories of electric universe or the theories of comments, which I'm, if we have time, I'd like to maybe get into that very quickly as well. But in terms of the technology, I've got a keen eye, and I'm looking at the photograph that, I, that, that you supplied me with for the, um, for the guest write-up on the secretteachings.info, and I believe 
that I see the Wardenclyffe Tower in a, in, in, a, in a, it looks like a PowerPoint slide, perhaps, in a speech that you gave. So in relationship to the Wardenclyffe Tower, J.P. Morgan and Nikola Tesla, who is a big name in terms of alternative broadcasts like this and a lot of times misconstrued, the level of technology, it seems to me, James, on one level is that we have a suppression of technology and that the general populace tends to believe that maybe what you're saying is outlandish because it's not necessarily accepted as mainstream because, look, we have textbooks, we have doctors, we have PhDs, and this is what is reality. And even if you can prove otherwise, people really aren't apt to change their perception so quickly. Even under the, the basic financial belief that I spent thousands of dollars to go to college, I'm not going to throw all of that out because some guy says, even with facts, says that it's wrong. Not that that's necessarily what you're saying. So to really expand and, and ask my question here, what type, from your understanding, what type of technological advancement exists beyond the scope of what the general populace sees? Because we, we say that alternative energies and, and, and concepts such as the Wardenclyffe Tower and free energy, all of that's, all of that's cuckoo. But at the same time, there are not just multinational corporations, black operations, but, but governments alone that go on abusing and, 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 and misconstruing and distorting people like you on purpose or by association. And yet then on behind the scenes, they go and develop that same type of technology in a much more advanced form. What is the level of technology behind the scenes as far as, far as you know? Well, uh, my one book called Atlantis to Tesla, the Goldwyn Connection, uh, back in the, as I was developing a lot of what I did, uh, when I was working with Russian scientists in the mid-90s, we developed weather control. Uh, now, you've heard about HARP, but what we developed was an ability to use satellite lasers to control hurricanes and tornadoes, and the purpose was to steer them away from coastlines and population zones to cause the water to dump offshore, because with most hurricanes, the water damage is, uh, the flooding damage is much worse than the wind. Uh, so anyway, we developed this technology, and it was absconded with by the U.S. military, which has been using it like Katrina was a totally controlled storm using lasers, uh, other hurricanes, uh, etc. In fact, the Russian scientists went to the U.N. Uh, in the early 2000s and said, hey, the United States is using weather modification against its own people and against other countries, and it has to be listed as a weapon of war. That's what they were saying, and it has to be outlawed by the Geneva Convention. The United States, who basically controls the UN and the banking uh, cartel of the European banking cartel, refused to do that. They didn't because it was a major tool that they could use surreptitiously uh, to control the weather. And the way it's done is that the laser beams discharge the electrical path from the ionosphere down to the cloud systems, and you can create hurricanes, you can create tornado systems. You can direct them around like leading a bull around with a ring in its nose. Uh, and also, out of that same work, I developed the understanding of what Tesla was doing. One of the biggest pieces of misinformation, which is in movies, it's in all of the web pages that so-called talk about Tesla, is that he was using it to transmit energy. Well, where was Tesla going to get the energy to transmit? <laughs> you know, he sold all his technology for the, the three-phase generators and the coal plants and the distribution of energy, he sold that to uh, J.P. Morgan in Westinghouse. Uh, uh, so he did, where was he going to get the energy to distribute? What Tesla was doing was tapping into the vertical electric field, and it's not free energy, that's a misnomer. It was energy that came from a source, although Tesla really didn't understand. He was not aware of where that energy was coming from. What my work did was rediscover what Tesla was doing and identified the physical source of energy that he was tapping into. And that's why um, J.P. Morgan tore down the towers out in Colorado and the Wardenclyffe Towers, because they realized what he was doing. He had tapped into a free source of energy, and they wanted to sell energy. You can't sell energy that, that comes uh, out of the an infinite source from beyond the planet, uh, because, because uh, it's free. You know, coal and then eventually nuclear, the, the same disaster, that we're dealing with now, Fukushima, of course, a mad, a mad uh, insane situation, or Chernobyl, uh, is uh, as a result of them demanding that we purchase energy, which is a great misnomer. Uh, so the real thing that Tesla was doing was uh, gathering energy from the ionosphere, and he was distributing actually underground. He wasn't distributing it through the air. Uh, that's a misnomer also. The experiments he did out in Colorado 
were distributing that atmospheric electricity through the ground. He put, uh, uh, as far as 20 miles away, he could light light bulbs. And so he was transmitting through the ground the energy he gathered from atmospheric electricity. Uh, and so uh, my work rediscovered that and also identified the energy source that he was using. But of course, it's not in the energy industry best interest to talk about that. So in there's a movie, Sherlock Holmes, they, they have Tesla in there, and they, they uh, talk about him transmitting energy. But if you look at, like I say, you pull back the first layer, where was he getting the energy to transmit? You know, it's stupid. Uh, Tesla was gathering energy from the ionosphere, and that's why they kept him buttonholed. And when he finally died, they went in and confiscated all his work, and uh, it's, it's never seen the light of day since. All his, his real secret work on energy technology, etc. cetera. jmccannyscience.com, that's the website of our guest tonight. The website for The Secret Teachings is thesecretteachings.info. If you want to go to the website and check out James's work, if you don't go directly to his website, there is a link to the website from our website. You can also find our full... Uh, yeah, let, let's start with the climate issue. Um, the, the, uh, let's, let's just look at it this way. As we go into nighttime, the Earth temperature drops about 20 degrees. When we talk about climate uh, uh, or long-term, uh, you know, a, a few degrees centigrade over a 20-year period increase in temperature or something, uh, we drop about 10 to 20 degrees every night, depending on if you're in the wintertime or summertime, etc. If it's cloudy out, the temperature does not drop as much because that uh, the uh, moisture in the air is a heat content sink. In other words, it holds more of the heat in the air. But the idea that you're driving your SUV up and down the road and that's causing climate change is absurd. Uh, let's just look at this. When you're burning gasoline or diesel in your car, the amount of heat generated is a million times more than the gr so-called greenhouse effect that would, over a 20-year period, add a little bit of, of heat uh, in the, into the atmosphere. So what happens to all of that heat that's generated immediately from nuclear power plants, coal plants, 80% of which goes right up into the atmosphere every day. Uh, that's far more than the so-called long-term greenhouse effect. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's like hitting something with a giant mallet and then coming along with a little teeny copper uh, hammer and tapping on something and saying the little teeny hammer does a lot more. It's so absurd, but, but this is the problem with a lot of the public today is they don't understand science. And so they can take these concepts, whitewash the public, the public starts repeating them. And as Lyndon Johnson once said, uh, you repeat something a few times, uh, people become interested, you repeat it enough time, it becomes the truth. <laughs> and that's about what's going on. It, it does, it becomes, so anyway, a, it becomes a buzzword uh, that people use. Yeah, yeah, and it, there doesn't have to be any scientific basis. And unfortunately, scientists themselves uh, get their peanuts from the government and 99.9% .9 of all scientists uh, make their living from, uh, in some way from government-funded science, so they have to march the march and talk the talk. But, uh, and, and that's where a lot of that has come from, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, that's a whole topic. But just from some simple scientific examples, like the Earth dropping 20-degree temperature in the middle of the night, if the sun turned off one day, and this was your original question, the sun really controls our temperature. And to be real honest with you, we don't have uh, anything like climate. Climate would be like over uh, a 10,000 or a million year period where the earth is stable. Our climate is controlled minute to minute by the output of the sun, both uh, uh, light energy over the entire electromagnetic spectrum and electrically. The, uh, the El Nino effect in the Pacific Ocean is a joule heating from electricity coming down through the atmosphere. That's what it is. Uh, and it's it's not the cause of hurricanes or severe weather. It's one of the byproducts uh, of the electric uh, nature of our weather. So another big misnomer. Anyway, I could go on and on about that. But uh, basically, yeah, our climate is controlled by the sun on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. We don't we don't have climate. There's no such thing as climate. We have instantaneous heat. And if the sun turned off right now, uh, it would be about. 20 hours until we all went into the deep freeze. It would be about 48 hours till the atmosphere crystallized and fell out of the sky, and that would be the end of life as you know it. So, 
Well, well, here's the thing to me, James. Uh, I'm 25 years old. I didn't go to conventional college. I've written three books. I've hosted this radio show for about six years, going on seven years now. I've interviewed dozens and hundreds of people like yourself. I have no religious, no political affiliations, but I'm also not an anarchist or an atheist. I've got no place so someone can put me in a box and associate me with the positive or negative aspects of a particular viewpoint or a particular standpoint on a subject. So when I look at a situation like this, I'm also not a scientist. I, I, I did a little bit of physics in high school and uh, a little bit when I was in uh, technical school. But I never graduated with a degree or, or claimed to be a scientist or a physicist. But when I look at it from an unbiased point of view, I just find it absurd that kids nowadays are being literally programmed to believe that the sun has no effect on what happens here on Earth. I mean, I find that to just be laughable at, at, at best. Yeah, education is absurd. I, I say it in my white paper, and I say this in different venues. Uh, the white paper on the Nazca Lions, I mentioned this, that if you go to college, 95% of what you learn there couldn't possibly be true. Uh, and that's really correct. If you start breaking it down piece by piece, piece by piece, uh, and uh, I mean covering all topics, whether it's economics or whether it's uh, uh, geology, whether it's astronomy, uh, you get into a basic physics course, sure, you, you know, you incline plane, gravity, a lot of that stuff is well understood and you can do experiments and, you know, the charge on the electron experiment, etc. But you start getting a bit more advanced than that and you get into some really gray area where opinions and almost religious beliefs carry the day. So, uh, yeah, and, and uh, a lot of this filters down from so-called science uh, which is NASA or the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or the Hurricane Prediction Center, which uh, has a model which has no reality in it at all. Uh, you know, it, it just goes on and on and on. So uh, I would say that 95% of what you learn in college couldn't, couldn't possibly be true. But uh, uh, when the trouble is when people get out, you mentioned this, that uh, they paid a lot of money for that education, and it's going to be pretty hard to convince them that everything they learned was a piece of you-know-what. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, uh, that's part of the problem is people's egos, that they're smart, and they, they got an education, and they, you know, that's a very big problem. Just, well, just like that Ph.D. that you didn't get. Right, right. And that's, I'll be, be honest with you, that's the best thing I ever did in my life was not get a Ph.D., because I'm here now, my classroom is, you know, I have my radio show heard worldwide on Thursday evenings. Uh, I have a classroom, I don't, don't even know how big it is, but it's a lot bigger than any university classroom ever thought of being. Uh, and, and uh, you know, and I'm teaching what I teach when, when I teach science, it's in such a way that people can understand it. I'm not saying I got a PhD and therefore you better believe me. Uh, that's the Carl Sagan attitude. We're smart, you're dumb like Danny DeVito in the movie Melissa. You know, I'm big, you're small, I'm smart, you're dumb. That's the Carl Sagan attitude or the Cornell University attitude of education. And, and you're just a, a person in the public and you just better believe what we say because uh, you're too stupid to understand it. So just believe it. Yep, we're big, you're little. We're yeah. smart, you're dumb. You're a mind to be molded and we are the artist. Uh, James, if you couldn't, if you can, uh, if it's possible, in maybe two or three minutes, if you could sum up your theory on comets, and then I'll give you the floor for a few minutes to say anything else you'd like to say. Websites, tell us a little bit about your radio show and whatnot. Uh, yeah, the the situation. Well, first of all, the standard science is comets are dirty snowballs that they sublimate when they get near the sun. That's completely incorrect. What I learned, and this is back in the this was solidified in my years at Cornell in 1979. But basically, this, the sun uh, puts out an excess current of positive charge, creates a capacitor, and any object that comes into that capacitor is going to discharge it. And if you look at the plasma physics of a discharging object, I use the backyard bug killer as an example. When the, it's a, called the zapper, you know, the mosquito flies in between two charge plates, and the uh, plates discharge always where the bug is. Why is that? Because the bug... Uh, it bridges the gap, so to speak, electrically. The same thing happens with an object that comes into the solar system. It discharges the solar capacitor. The sun is negatively charged relative to the outer positive part of the capacitor, which is way out beyond Pluto. And so the, that's what uh, the electrons form the majority charge carrier. They form a negative charge around the nucleus. 
because of pressure. It's like putting a rock in a stream. It forms a negative uh, pressure there. And uh, that draws in the tail material, which comes in much more slowly because the ions and dust particles are charged positively, but they much, move much more slowly. And that's a comet. And it has all the properties of a comet and is very complicated. Uh, this is what my books, etc., a lot of my radio shows, Earth, the planets are all acting as comets. We have a comet tail. Uh, our weather is directly affected because we discharge the solar capacitor. So anyway, that's a comet. So just about everything in outer space is a comet. Uh, including our sun in the galactic electric field. Uh, so anyway, that's the that's the short version. Certainly it gets more complicated, but that's the short version. Sure, sure. Well, James, I want to thank you very much for joining me on the show and, and for going for the two hours tonight. Uh, I, I've got to say that I, I like science. I always have liked science. I always liked physics. Uh, and I've always, of course, liked discussing these subjects in the detail that we have tonight. Uh, but in terms of the way that you presented this and... Yeah, I, I mean, I just take you as a, as a relatively honest person. With You're not trying to push an agenda. So to me, um, and I'm sure your students probably feel like this too, you've sort of made science seem fun. And when people think something's fun, they'll want to participate in it. They'll want to learn more about it. And I think a lot more teachers should, should at least present in, in the type of manner and capacity that you present this information. Because, I mean, I think that we have a whole generation of kids who think learning is, is, is dumb and learning is boring. And you have those types of P, the, what I call the Ph.D. mentality, people that just they set up in front of a class and they have a chalkboard or a whiteboard or a PowerPoint presentation. And they just repeat back what their teachers told them and repeat what the textbooks say or they write their own textbook and then just repeat back what they wrote. And nobody really learns anything. And the same old scientific, quote unquote, theories, which are presented as assumptions and facts, which they're just theories, they're not necessarily provable facts, and they're presented as facts, and people go along repeating those as fact. And then when someone like yourself comes along and you present an alternative theory, if you will, it shakes up their little paradigm. It shakes up their little world. So for the work that you've done, thank you, first of all. And uh, if you'd like to talk about anything else, uh, give out a website, something about your radio show, Go ahead. Uh, we've got about two or three minutes here. Well, uh, thank you, Ryan. I appreciate the opportunity to be on the show. And uh, it, this is, these are very complex topics. Uh, my webpage has about six gigabytes of information. So uh, I, I tell people that when you go there, get a pretty big cup of coffee and uh, plan to spend some time there. I have my books. Uh, there's a series of 10 books now. The white paper here is number 11. I have a series of CDs, DVDs. Uh, but just go there, and uh, uh, it's, it's going to take many times going back. And uh, but you got to understand, um, uh, you know, pretty much the web page is self-explanatory. So that's what I would say: go there. Uh, and by the way, I have a short URL which gets you to the same web page. It's seven letters: jmccsci.com. It's an abbreviated form of J. McCanny Science, just because um, uh, for radio I got that so people could. Uh, remember, it's uh, jmccsci.com. We'll get you to the same web page. But go there, spend some time, and listen to my past radio shows. They're all archived on the web page. Uh, and it's it's a very complicated topic, but with time, uh, I think you can, uh, literally anybody can understand this and then start to uh, really understand what I call fairy tale science, standard science, uh, you know, the tier two garbage science that they pawn off on the public. And once you realize that, you'll realize that there's a, there is an agenda to keep real information from the public. I think that becomes very obvious, especially with what you've divulged to us tonight. Uh, again, James McCanny, our guest, he gave out the shortened version of his website address, JMCCSCI, was that it? Correct. JMCCSCI.com. His information, bio, photograph, and the website is linked up on our website www.thesecretteachings.info. And James, if you could just hang on for a moment with me on the line, uh, I'd like to see if we could talk for a few minutes off air, if that would be fine with you. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'll go ahead and bring your volume down now. But again, thank you for joining me on the show, and uh, I'll talk to you in a few minutes here. Thank you. Welcome to Non-Human Entities YouTube channel. Please subscribe, like, and share if you enjoy this show.
website, www.thesecretteachings.info. Please go to the website, check out our full show archive, completely free to access for everybody. You do not have to sign up or do anything. You click the link, you find the show, the guest, the topic, and you can download it or stream it for free. You'll also find a top news tab with our current events. You'll find my books on the website as well as links to Amazon.com. And you'll find a guest tab with past and current and future guests. Tonight, our guest, James McCanny, his website is linked up at thesecretteachings.info. He's got a pretty lengthy bio, and I couldn't really pick out of it what I thought was the most important. So I'll go ahead and bring the audio for James up here. And uh, welcome to the show, and I'll let you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Ryan. First of all, how's the sound? Is it good? Uh, it came in a little hot, but it is good now. Uh, yeah, well, my background, uh, I have a master's degree in physics, solid state and nuclear physics from Tulane University in 1975. Before that, I, my bachelor's degree I got from St. Mary's College, which is now St. University, St. Mary's University in Winona, Minnesota. And I had a double major in physics and mathematics, but... Uh, uh, I had the opportunities to get a Ph.D. in physics, and I just turned them down. I, I didn't want to be buttonholed into a specialty, and so I took off after my master's degree, and I went back to Latin America where I'd been uh, previously and uh, just uh, traveled and got to understand uh, some of the ins and outs of archaeology. I kept my research, my personal research was in the area of celestial mechanics, which is the study of the movement of the stars and planets, gravity. And I started uh, including electric and magnetic fields in my uh, calculations in my studies. And uh, in 1979, I ended up at a place called Cornell University as a faculty member. And at that time, the Voyager spacecraft, the Pioneer spacecraft, many planetary probes were bringing back information from other planets. And I was able to use the data from those spacecraft to verify my studies regarding the electromagnetic nature of the solar system. So that started a long, my lifelong study. It led into my work with weather, the electrical conditions in the solar system which drive our weather, and uh, many other studies. The, my most recent study was actually just a surprise. I was in Peru. Uh, traveling, and uh, I have an invention called the wing generator, which is a very efficient system for extracting energy from wind. And I was in Peru scoping out the market for this because that's uh, it's we're uh, commercializing the first uh, model, which is the 12 meter. We call it the Pegasus. And I was scoping out uh, Peru for the market, and I happened to call upon something called the Nazca Plains. And uh, I had seen them before in pictures, never really paid much attention to them. But while I was on the site, I, in fact, uh, was on some of the mounds overlooking the plains. And I realized that these were atmospheric collection, uh, elect atmospheric electricity collection points driving out into these figures that were out in the Nazca plains. And so that's my uh, current release that came out December 31st, uh, this past December 31st. It is entitled uh, Nazca Palpa Lines, the Mystery Solved Ancient Interferometer Fractal Antenna Complex. So what I discovered is that these lines that nobody could figure out what they were, or why the, uh, we don't really know who made them probably 5, 10, 15,000 years ago or possibly before, uh, why they made these. And what I discovered is these were antennas, an extremely complex antenna system. And their sole purpose was to signal uh, other star systems using atmospheric electricity as the power source because uh, this antenna grid array covers about 350 square kilometers of uh, terrain on the Palpa Plains, on the pampas of central, west central Peru. Uh, so this is a signaling uh, mechanism for clearly for uh, signaling to and possibly receiving signals from other star systems. So this is a major, major archaeological discovery. But anyway, there's uh, uh, there's many, many other aspects to my background, uh, things that I study. But anyway, I'll stop there. And uh, on my webpage, which you said there's a link to my webpage, uh, uh, the people can check that out. My webpage has about six gigabytes of information on it. So uh, get a big cup of coffee when you go there and plan to spend a little bit of time. Well, I spent some time today looking through your NASCA lines, uh, the, the, the work that you did, the document that you sent me, and I honestly didn't have time to go through the entire document, but 
I was looking at some of the images and I was skimming through some of the information. And, and I do have other lines, uh, other questions about some of the lines in your bio as well. Uh, but let me go ahead and ask you this. This is the first thing that came to my mind. In terms of this being what you call an interferometer fractal antenna complex, what exactly was the motivation, in your opinion, and maybe you know this, maybe it's in the document, I didn't catch it, for constructing these lines into the shapes of spiders or into the shapes of birds or monkeys? What, what, why, what does that have to do with the antenna aspect of this? Well, what I've uh, come to conclude is that these were designed and left for us to find. And if these were only in the say, shape of rectangles or V-shaped or other uh, just uh, somewhat common, say, say uh, spirals, which are common fractal antenna shapes, uh, we might mistake them for possibly just agricultural troughs. They, what, what they are is they're sh small troughs, maybe a foot across or some are as much as a meter or a couple meters across, uh, and then dug out uh, just to a few inches or up to 10 inches deep. Uh, so at any rate, the, uh, the purpose for putting the shapes there is to draw our attention to them. Now, these, uh, these can only be seen from, from the air, correct? Yes, uh, although some scholars, there's, there's some controversy over that, but literally they can only be seen, and they were discovered from the air. A guy named Paul Kosek saw these from an airplane. The first time they were identified for what they are was 1941. A pilot named Paul Kosek flew over the Nazca planes on purpose to see what they looked like from the air, and he saw one of the bird shapes. Now, there are hundreds of these scattered all over the Nazca planes, distributed in a, in a very interesting pattern once you get up and you see them all. But my conclusion, to answer your question, is that these were left there for us to discover. Uh, the, uh, the monkey, which is the, the first one I have the, that's the cover photo, so to speak, on this white paper, which is 72 pages long, is rather dense. So, uh, yeah, it, it's going to take people a, a bit of time to go through it all and digest it. But uh, the monkey is a great example of a, a zoomorphic figure, which is the monkey, his tail, which is a spiral, is a fractal antenna, very common fractal antenna design. To his front and side are uh, broken dipole fractal antennas, which is a very common fractal antenna design. And then off of his feet, um, uh, an extension comes another rectangular grid fractal array, which is a very common a fractal array. And let me, for those people who are wondering what a fractal antenna is, your cell phone, your tablet, uh, uh, modern devices have a fractal antenna. If you remember about 10 years ago, your cell phone had a little antenna, you'd pull it out, a little uh, dipole antenna. Uh, and those were replaced by what is known as a fractal antenna. So basically, you take a long dipole antenna, you break it up physically into small shapes, and it has the same collection and transmission characteristics as a long dipole antenna, but it's very compact. So it sits down in the corner of your cell phone. And I have a whole uh, discussion, chapters and appendices on fractal antenna design. This is something I'm very familiar with because I spent 25 years in the telecommunications industry. But uh, if they only left uh, just squares or rectangles or other, or simply lines, which are the dipole antennas, or cross dipoles where they're cross lines, uh, we might mistake them for something else, maybe just astronomical pointers or something. But the fact that they're in shape of monkeys and spiders and whales and birds and things like that really bring our attention to them. In fact, most tourist pictures that you see leave out the, uh, the geometric shape fractal antenna part of this. Uh, most times you see the monkey, for example, without any of the other fractal antennas which are connected to it. I've seen that. Mind yes. you, these are all connected together, too. So when I'm looking at these lines and, and, and just using the example you gave about cellular phones and how tablets and our phones now have these fractal antennas in them, that's more of a modern technology per se. So going back to the Nazca lines, is this... I mean, obviously, that type of technology is much more advanced, especially for the time period these were supposedly erected. What is your conclusion or what is your speculation on how these came about? Is this an ancient human civilization? Uh, wh what is the issue there? I don't know if you've been asked that before. Well, in the paper, I give five scenarios. Uh, the first two, uh, uh, because I'm trying to figure out who did this, too, because we don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things we know. For example, 
Machu Picchu, we know that the Incas built those. Uh, there's other things we know that pre-Incas built those. Uh, but the Nazca lines, we don't have any idea who built them. Uh, some archaeologists speculate that they were built by uh, the, uh, there's a uh, set of temples, etc., and structures near Nazca. And some archaeologists say, oh, it must have been these people. But when you see that the, this, uh, that those people living there were, you know, cooking in clay pots over wood, wood fires with using wooden spoons, you realize that they really didn't have anything, uh, uh, they didn't have any technology that would imply that they knew how to put these designs out there. There's nothing else in their civilization that would indicate that they did this. So my conclusion is that is totally incorrect. And, but anyway, the first two scenarios that I give, uh, these 